I knew the guy that fired the cannons there. He's a nurse. And we volunteered there on the weekend and he would fire all the cannons and we went and saw him do it once. Did they do that when you were there? No. Oh. Yeah. It was very fun. <laughs> Yeah. I know we always have this at Hopkins too. It's like some topics are just not very interesting, you know? Yeah, it'd be nice to see them. Talk to another keep up with any of the other oh, yeah. people from the program. Mm -hmm. So Allison yeah. lives in Philly. She's a vet. Very successful. Mary. Yeah, I just Katie is in San Francisco. Um, Katie. Katie Souls Giver, she's a postdoc. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she was working, she had worked at, she went to Penn when she left here and worked there for a while, then met someone, moved to San Francisco with him. Penn kept her employed remotely for like five years, and she just decided to um, to resign from that. And she's working with a startup. Um, it was like behavioral health coaching that it seems really promising. They just got a second round of investments. It's like millions of dollars, and she's just I've always marveled at like she's willing to take these risks with stuff like that. You know, she's like an early adopter. She's like. To start up there in their first year, but I just feel good about it, so I'm going to do it. So she just um, switched it out, and she's loving it. Um, and Ed is out in San Francisco as well, and he got. I think he went to. He, I think he's a physician assistant. He like went through that program. Is he the better nurse practitioner? One of the two. Um, right. Matt Scanlon got his PhD in something related to like health psychology and cardiac health. And he's in Ohio, I think, with a wife and child, at least one child. Dana, do you remember Dana? He was yeah. he was a research assistant with us for like one year. Yeah. He is a professor at the University of Maine now. <laughs> yeah, and not a full, I mean, he's like assistant wow. professor, but yeah, he, he did his training in New York in like cognitive, cognitive psychology, I think. Okay. And he's doing really well up there. He's got a son. Who else? I think that's like our core group that we worked with on those trials. Ginger. Who is it? Jim Eric. No, that wasn't me. Jimmy mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nancy Kinlan, the nurse that worked with us for a bit. She's in Baltimore now. Strangely, yeah. So she works, I think, at Hopkins, but Hopkins is so large. And I think she works at Hopkins. Or maybe the University of Maryland, but it's like a. I've only seen her once since she was mm -hmm. since she was there. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. Yeah. Like, yeah. Can't think of any other. Who was here? Which time? Yeah, times. that's like the core group that yeah. that I work with okay. in terms of the like the research assistants and everyone. Yeah, but everyone's doing really well. So. Sounds yeah, like we <laughs> yeah. very successful. Yeah, <laughs> very good core. Everyone did well. Especially like, um, so Allison being a vet, I don't know if you remember, she and I got puppies at the same time that we're siblings. So it's, our dogs are now nine years old and um, we're able to compare stories across them, which is real fun. Is coming? She had something that was scheduled for today that conflicted and she didn't realize. Yeah. So I saw her last night for dinner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bunch of the people that kind of rotated through our program and the clinic and yeah. day one are still around. Is Marnie still at the Chinon Center? Yeah. What about Jen Fine? Jen Fine? Um, yeah. She, I think she's a nurse practitioner now. I think so. But I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, Marnie was still around. She was looking to retire this year. Is she? Okay. Well, I guess it has to happen sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I think we should probably get going here. Yeah. So we're going to um, go ahead and get going and make sure that Kelly.
has the time she needs for her presentation. So uh, it's not, you don't hear it? Okay. You hearing it? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know what this, maybe we should try turning this on. Um, Hold on, switch here. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, it must be at the top here. Off. All right. How about now? It's coming through. Yep. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to go ahead and get going. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce Kelly Dunn, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. But she is also a graduate of the PhD program here in human behavioral pharmacology that um, is housed in the Department of Psychiatry with us, but is um, through the Department of Psychology here. So we can all, um, uh, we all take some pride in having one of our own come back and, and give a lecture here. And um, Kelly is just a um, outstanding scholar. So the title shows you where her, um, her interest in, and work is now. Um, but she has um, done excellent research across almost all drugs of abuse in some capacity, illicit and illicit drugs. Um, so Kelly came to uh, the uh, University of Vermont to pursue her PhD, and um, um, she finished it in 2009. So I guess she came around 2004 or five, and uh, worked mostly uh, worked as um, a student of Stacy Sigmund's. Um, but I, I was thrilled to have an opportunity to collaborate with her on a lot of the projects she did under Stacy uh, Tulich. And so one thing you, you quickly learn about, uh, about Kelly is she's just um, really thorough and just takes to uh, research like a duck to water, but she's also a wonderful person and just um, so easy to work with and so caring that I think the caring part really influences her work. Um, when she finished with us, she had mostly, uh, a lot of her work with, with Stacy was researching smoking cessation in opiate-dependent patients. She went on to Johns Hopkins for her postdoctoral fellowship um, and finished that in 2012, and she did that in the really um, well-known behavioral pharmacology research unit at Johns Hopkins, where many of us, Stacy, myself, got, got, did our postdoctoral fellowships. And um, uh, Kelly's performance was sufficiently meritorious there that she was a invited to stay on as a faculty member. And um, I was just so impressed in reviewing her CV this morning, knowing that I was going to have to make some opening remarks. I looked at um, her grant support, and, and just um, nine years uh, after finishing her PhD and six years after finishing her uh, postdoctoral fellowship, she is the PI on three NIH R01s and one uh, R34 grant. That is an amazing amount of grant support for someone that early in her career. And it's a bit um, of retrospective analysis on my part, but you could see the work ethic and you could see the ability to, to, to identify um, uh, interesting and important ideas almost from the first day she, she came with us. So, um, you know, I, I recommend uh, Kelly as a role model to our, our students, our trainees, as somebody who really demonstrates that, um, that you can still have a wonderful career in NIH-supported research. Um, so I, I encourage you to, if you haven't done so already, to, um, uh, to try and take advantage of Kelly's um, visit and spend some time with her. Um, and uh, so I think without uh, further ado, I'd ask you to help me welcome Kelly back to the University of Vermont.
Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. I appreciate that. And thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you about this research. So uh, a lot of my current research is focused on the opiate use um, epidemic and opiate use disorder treatment. So I thought what I would do is kind of describe um, the set the context for you regarding the opiate epidemic currently and some of the emerging data that are that are coming out and then talk about some studies that we're doing at BPRU now. So we've done a randomized controlled trial looking at treatment options for opiate use disorder and uh, that includes an anal a secondary analysis where we're trying to optimize or identify people for whom the treatments might work best and then also kind of lay out the next course of studies that we think we're going to do which is looking at different mechanisms contributing to the opiate withdrawal syndrome. So you've, you're probably familiar with the notion that there's an opiate epidemic or that there's a, an increase in the number of people who are using opiates and have opiate related consequences. And I often get asked where the opiate epidemic started from and I think that there's a lot of contributing factors. Um, but one of them comes from the early 2000s where we had this emphasis, this change in emphasis in the United States on the treatment of pain as a vital sign. So we, uh, patients, pain was, um, considered the fifth vital sign in patients that went into treatment for any sort of condition were asked uh, to rate their level of pain. And from that kind of grew this pharmaceutical industry emphasis on treating pain and, and trying to manage pain and completely eliminate pain in patients. And so you can see here that over one third of spending, and th these are data from 2013, um, but the, the trend continues. So over one third of spending is concentrated in top five therapies and pain is the fifth highest category in terms of the medical expenditures. And that represents an $18.7 billion industry and a 4.1% growth. And we're continuing to see that growth um, throughout these, uh, the subsequent years after these data were collected. And we know that pain, uh, uh, prescription opiates are one of the primary uh, forms by which we treat pain. And so it may not surprise you that if you look at the number of patients who are treated with different medications, narcotics are actually the fifth most widely prescribed category of medications, which represented 14.9 million patients who were on uh, a narcotic therapy again in 2013. So there's an abundance of these medications available. And if you look at the actual breakdown in the prescriptions of specific medications, what you'll find is hydrocodone, which is Vicodin, was the single, the single most widely prescribed medication of all forms of medications, not just painkillers, but of all of these medications for about six years in a row. So it was the most widely prescribed drug. And we know that when a drug in substance abuse field, we know that availability of a medication or of a drug predicts the use of that. And so the fact that Vicodin or the painkillers were so widely prescribed contributed to a large availability of those and a corresponding increase in the number of people who were abusing them. Um, so, so there are multiple different metrics by which we can establish that there are significant societal problems with opiate use disorder. But one of them, I think the most prominently described is the rate of overdose that's occurring currently. And again, there's many contributing factors to that. We've done quite a bit of work with that at BPRU, and although I wasn't going to focus on that today, I'd be happy to talk about or to answer questions related to it at the end of the talk. But oh, these are data that were just published um, early this year, sort of late last year, that uh, suggested that the rate of the number of people who are dying from fatal overdoses related to opiates is actually so substantial that it's decreasing the life expectancy in the United States. So we see here that we're making huge improvements in terms of the contribution of life expectancy to treating diseases of the heart and malignancy, but we're actually seeing drug poisoning decrease the life expectancy. So there we're having profound uh, consequences related to opiate use disorder in the U.S. And so you may ask, you know, I think it's, it's more widely established that there are known consequences with the abusing opiates and that there's um, risk potential associated with them. So why do people continue to use them despite knowing that there are these consequences and especially knowing that there are, um, that the risk of overdose is much higher now than it has been in the past. And uh, I think it's important to recognize that when people come into treatment for opiate use disorder, what they generally tell us is that they started to use an opiate because uh, for a variety of reasons, sometimes it's to treat pain, sometimes it's because they like the way that it made them feel, so they like the high associated with it. But oftentimes, what they, the reason that they continue to use opiates is because they develop a physical dependence on them, and the absence of the opiate leads to a, a very aversive withdrawal syndrome. So if they become physically dependent on the opiate, 
And the rate at which that happens varies across people, and the severity of it varies across people. We're not very good at predicting that. Uh, but what we know is that if you abruptly stop, or even if you taper the opiate out of your system, and this occurs whether you used it illicitly or if you used it as prescribed for an extended period of time, you see this um, kind of standardized withdrawal syndrome occur. The early withdrawal is about 8 to 24 hours after the last use, and you see things like watery eyes, runny nose, um, yawning, restlessness, insomnia. Um, you can see goose flesh, muscle twitching, aches and pains, abdominal pain. It can progress to more severe things like nausea, diarrhea, vomiting. Um, after one to three days, these uh, symptoms become more severe. They can become more severe. And so it's essentially like a very extreme case of the flu, which doesn't sound very aversive because we've probably all had the flu. Certainly, I think this season, um, many more of us have been, were exposed to it. Hopefully, hopefully not, but I think it was much more prominent this year than in other, in previous years. And it doesn't, it sounds some, it sounds like something that is relatively tolerable unless you're the person experiencing it. When, in which case, you know that if you're halfway through, if you're five days into a flu, and you can take a single dose of any medication, just a single dose, and it completely eliminates that feeling, it's very easy to convince yourself that that is the right thing to do. And that uh, it's a, because you have, you know, you have responsibilities, you have work, you have child care, you have um, school responsibilities, and you just don't have time to go through this entire withdrawal syndrome. So you put it off and you decide that you're going to do it later, at a later date. And that kind of contributes to this cycle of opiate use disorder. And over time, it becomes more severe and more difficult to manage. So a lot of our treatments focus on helping patients manage this withdrawal syndrome because that tends to be the primary driver, one of the primary reasons by which they continue to use opiates once they, even despite the fact that they experience consequences related to it. And so that is the basis on which we provide agonist treatments for patients. So we use agonist opiate agonists, which help to su suppress some of the withdrawal symptoms. For feasibility, we generally give a long-acting opiate agonist because we don't want to have to dose them more than once a day, especially if we have to dose them in a supervised setting. It's not feasible for them to come back several times. And that uh, generally is um, achieved with methadone, which was the original treatment form, and now more recently buprenorphine, which is sold in, under different trade names, but that includes Suboxone or Zubsol. And uh, so we can maintain people for a period of time where we help them to control their withdrawal, or we can eventually start to taper them down off of the medications so that they're no longer opiate dependent. They have no physical dependence on opiates. And we, we currently have available different medications that work as opiate blockers that we can transition them to so that we can help them prevent relapse once they taper off of the medications. If you compare these two general forms of treatment, maintenance versus detox or tapering, what you find is that patients do better when they're maintained. So these are data that compared patients that were being treated from a primary care setting, and they, uh, they were being maintained, or they were being treated with buprenorphine, and this is a survival curve of the number of patients that remain in treatment and you can see that when they were maintained at the end of a 14-week period, you had significantly more people um, who remained in treatment and were doing well, were rated as doing well relative to people who had tapered. And this pattern is true across just about every study that's directly compared these. The risk of tapering is that uh, we don't control the withdrawal. We still don't have a lot of understanding of the mechanisms contributing to the withdrawal, and so we don't... Um, uniformly control it well with patients. They still have to, even though we're giving them doses in a controlled manner, they're still experiencing withdrawal. And so some people don't tolerate that very well. And then the risk becomes that they leave treatment prematurely. If they relapse, they can, they're can they more prone to having an overdose event or a fatal overdose event. And so there's a lot of concern in the field that we even continue offering tapering as a treatment option because we know that when you compare the two directly, people do better with the maintenance option. The problem with that is that the maintenance option um, is not uniformly or ubiquitously available. So we've made great strides in the United States to, to expand our treatment availability for both methadone and particularly for buprenorphine, which is something that can be prescribed from any primary care physician's office if they've completed a, a relatively brief uh, training program. And what you see here are data um, across several years. And this is the rate of past year opiate abuse or dependence. So we're seeing increases over time in the number of people who qualify or who, who need treatment. 
and we're seeing increases in the number of people who are getting access to buprenorphine. Um, and we're seeing, let's see, uh, but what we're seeing is this uh, major gap, right? So we see these are patients who are on methadone, so we're not really doing very much to expand our methadone. There's infrastructure reasons why that's the case, but we do have the ability to expand buprenorphine. And although we're seeing that it's working, we are successfully expanding it. This is a huge treatment gap right here. So 96% of states at this time had rates of opiate use disorder that exceeded their capacity to maintain patients. And in 78% of the states, the majority of the clinics were already operating at 80% capacity or higher. So we really don't have the infrastructure that we need to, to sufficiently maintain all of the patients who are on opiate use or who, who would qualify for treatment. And as a result, uh, the predominant form of treatment that people are receiving are opiate detoxes. Because opiate detoxes can be conducted um, more easily. They're generally three to four day treatments. They can be in outpatient or hospital based settings. And so that's, so we see, um, if you look at epidemiological indicators or different treatment uh, resources, that that's the predominant form of treatment. So that we have this kind of ethical dilemma where we know that patients may do better with maintenance, um, but they're more likely to get a detox. And so we need to improve the manner by which we're detoxing people or the success rate to do that. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities for us to do that. Oh, and the final slide related to this, these were data that were actually collected here um, by Dr. Sigmund, suggests that when patients, when physicians are, in addition to us needing to increase the number of people who are eligible to prescribe buprenorphine, if you, if you increase um, the number of physicians in an area that are prescribing, if you look at the number of patients to whom they are prescribing, you actually see that it's very limited. They can prescribe up to 250 people after two years, after one year. Um, but on average, it looks like the majority of physicians are only prescribing to about five. And so there are some pockets where they're prescribing very high numbers because they're focusing on buprenorphine prescribing. But many providers are really, it looks like, just prescribing to the patients who are already in their practice who developed an opiate use problem, but they're not taking on new patients. So we've put a lot of effort into expanding the number of people who are eligible to prescribe, but it hasn't converted into the number of patients who are receiving treatment in the manner that we thought it would. So again, I'm, uh, what I hope I've convinced you of is that there is this existing opiate use disorder problem. We have treatments that uh, are efficacious, but we have infrastructure problems related to making them widely available. And that I think that there's a lot of value in trying to improve not only in one domain, uh, the number of physicians who are prescribing, and I won't speak about that, but also um, our, our efficacy with regard to detoxing patients, so that knowing that that's the predominant form of treatment that they're receiving. So I'm gonna switch now to, tell, to talk about some of the research that we're doing at Hopkins to try to improve this. So we conducted a randomized controlled trial where we tried, we evaluated a new, for, a new potential pharmacotherapy for opiate tapering or opiate detox. The trial, we had, it was a three-group design. We enrolled patients who had opiate use disorder, and we randomly assigned them to one of three medications. The first is clonidine, which is listed here. Clonidine is an adrenergic agonist. It works uh, to suppress some of the symptoms of opiate withdrawal. It's something that's not FDA approved for opiate use disorder treatment or for opiate withdrawal management, but it's frequently prescribed off-label, very frequently. Um, for some patients, it works well, and for some people, it functions really like a placebo. Um, the benefits of clonidine, uh, so I have it kind of highlighted red are the, the downsides and green are the more positive sides, but it has relatively low withdrawal suppression and you have to administer it four times a day. So that can be kind of burdensome for the patients or for the providers. However, the abuse liability or the likelihood that patients would abuse it on its own is relatively low. Um, and the, the associated ease of prescribing is relatively high. So that means that the provider may be more willing to prescribe it. These are all, these are you know, different domains that are important to consider when evaluating pharmacotherapies. The contrast is suboxone or buprenorphine, which I've talked about. It's a partial opiate agonist and antagonist. It works very effectively to suppress symptoms of uh, opiate withdrawal. It's used both for tapering and for maintenance. Um, and that's a positive, and you can also, it's very long acting, so you can give it once a day, and that's useful for patient compliance and for um, managing the patient burden and the, the provider burden. However, the abuse liability of it is rated as somewhat moderate to high, so patients are, they, they can get euphoric effects or they do use it illicitly, 
um, maybe not as much as other opiates, but certainly more than clonidine. And the ease of prescribing is low because it's a Schedule three medication and there's regulations regarding how it can be prescribed or who can prescribe it. So there's advantages and disadvantages, and what I want to uh, impress upon you is that these two drugs really are complementary. The advantages of clonidine are the disadvantages of buprenorphine and so on. There's a third medication that has been studied in uh, laboratory settings by our lab for several years, um, which is Tramadol. It's sold as Ultram, uh, Tramadol Extended Release. So Tramadol has a unique mechanism of action. It is sold as an analgesic, has a painkiller, but the way that it works physiologically is that you actually have to swallow it and it has to be converted into a long-acting metabolite in your body before it exerts its primary effects. So it's unlikely that patients will uh, snort it or inject it because that really diminishes most of the effects. They have to physiologically convert it into a metabolite to get the analgesic effects. Uh, human laboratory studies suggested that the withdrawal suppression uh, properties of terminal were likely to be moderate, so probably somewhere between buprenorphine and clonidine, but it, it produces opiate-like effects. Uh, the abuse liability is rated as relatively low to moderate. Again, you can detect some euphoric effects, uh, but you can't escalate your use to the more severe forms of um, administration. The ease of prescribing when the study began uh, was very low, be, uh, sorry, very high, that should say, actually, because uh, it was completely unscheduled. It became scheduled during the course of the trial, which made it more complex to prescribe, although somewhat uh, easier than buprenorphine. And because it's an extended release formulation, you can prescribe it once a day. So it meets a lot of the strengths of both of these um, other medications. And we thought that, uh, that perhaps it would actually kind of fall between these medications in terms of efficacy for detoxing. So this is what the trial looked like. We enrolled patients who had opiate use disorder. They were illicit users. We brought everyone into a residential treatment center for about 28 days. For seven to 10 days, we converted them. We transitioned them all to morphine to the same dose, um, 120 milligrams, so 30 milligrams four times a day. We did that so everyone had, would have the, a relatively similar level of physical dependence at the point that they were enrolled into the trial. We also conducted a naloxone challenge, and I'll talk more about that and what that looks like in a minute. Um, we did that to help stratify. So this gave us a level of dependence rating for each participant. And then we randomly assigned them to receive either clonidine, tramadol, or buprenorphine. The medications were pres uh, provided in a double-blind, double-dummy design. So everyone took every form of medication. Um, they took a, a buprenorphine tablet that they dissolved into their tongue, and they took capsules four times a day, uh, because bu uh, clonidine has to be administered four times a day but they only actually received one active medication. So they didn't know what they received, and the nursing staff didn't know what they received. And at, after seven days of a blinded taper, they, also, they were all then switched to placebo for the remainder of the study. And again, they didn't know that they were switched to placebo at that point, and neither did the nursing staff. And this allowed us to capture any kind of uh, persistent or kind of residual effects of withdrawal that might have occurred. At the end of the study, they, we gave them another naloxone challenge to confirm that they were no longer physically dependent. And we uh, provided them access to the relapse prevention medication, naltrexone, if they wanted it or referred them to other treatments. And these are just the dose ranges here. So the maximum dose of clonidine was 0.8, the maximum dose of tramadol was 600, and the maximum dose of buprenorphine that they received was 8 milligrams, with 2 milligrams of naloxone. So these were our participants. We assessed 237 people. We randomized 106, however, three of them left before receiving any study medication. So the data that I'll show you are based on 103 people who received at least one dose of morphine um, as part of the study. And that broke into uh, 36 people who had received clonidine, 36 who received tramadol extended release, and 31 who received buprenorphine. And this is what our participants looked like. So they were uh, in early 40s, predominantly male. This was a, um, this will become an issue later, but we worked hard to enroll women, but it's difficult to enroll women into trials like this, particularly if there's a 28-day residential period. Um, they were 50% African American, about 50% Caucasian, predominantly never married, mostly unemployed. They were predominant heroin users, so we didn't exclude prescription opiate users or prospectively enroll heroin versus prescription opiate, but we're in Baltimore and, and the population are predominantly heroin users. Um, they had used for about uh, the 10 years prior, 
And we did have about 50% of people who were also reporting use of prescription opiates in the past 30 days. We saw no significant differences between the groups in any of the demographic or drug use characteristics that we evaluated. <clears throat> and so here are the primary outcomes. So I'll, I'll go walk through this slide for you. So this is the COW score. This is an observer rating of withdrawal that occurred on a daily basis. This actually, we rated this sev seven times a day. And I'm showing you the peak withdrawal from each day, so the most severe withdrawal that they experience each day. The stabilization period is the morphine period. Uh, we counted down, so this is days negative seven. Day negative one is the day right before the taper uh, began, and you can see that all three of the groups were collapsed together because they didn't. They were all treated in the same manner during that time. Uh, the rating score is on the y-axis, and you can see the mean, the actual maximum score rating is 48. Um, we truncated the scale at 12. Uh, this is a taper period, so the filled symbols indicate that they were receiving active medication, and the open symbols uh, are to remind you that they were receiving placebo medication during this phase, but again, they didn't know that they were on placebo. And so our primary outcome was the COWS, the observer rating. What we saw was a significant effect of phase, meaning we saw significant differences between the taper and post-taper periods, but we didn't see any differentiation of the group um, during the taper and no significant differentiation of the group during the post-taper phase. However, this is a, um, this kind of escalation in withdrawal ratings that we see in the buprenorphine group is something that we actually saw in a study that we conducted here um, as well that Stacey Sigmund ran. Um, and it's something that uh, we often tend to see in studies of tapering if the study does extend past the final day of the taper. Most uh, opiate detox studies end right here, so you don't see if there's any persistent effects. This is the day that people are discharged from the trial. If you do extend it out, then you do start to see this bump, this increase in withdrawal. Uh, we also looked at self-reported withdrawal symptoms, and so this is the SOWS, um, and it's set up the same. So during the stabilization period, you see it's relatively low. The first taper day, you see an increase, and what we saw here was more of a differentiation where the clonidine group actually had higher withdrawal ratings in the tramadol and in the buprenorphine groups during the taper. And again, we saw this increase in withdrawal that occurred in the buprenorphine maintained participants in the post-taper phase uh, relative to the tramadol and the clonidine groups. Um, so we wanted to look at this a little bit further, so we conducted something, we derived a value referred to as area under the curve. We, we wanted to look at the kind of the entire time course of withdrawal for these participants. And so what that looks like is if this is uh, an individual's rating of withdrawal during the taper and post-taper period, then we conducted, we um, calculate the area that exists underneath that curve and we derive a single value from that for the taper and post-taper period to be able to compare across participants. And again, this is kind of gives us an assessment of the magnitude of withdrawal for that person across that entire phase. If we look at that and we look at the self-reported withdrawal outcomes and you look at it as a function of taper, what we saw was significant differences in the clonidine group during the taper relative to the uh, tramadol and the buprenorphine group. So this group did have significantly higher rates of withdrawal as assessed using area under the curve um, relative to these two other groups, and we saw no significant differences between the groups during the post-taper period, uh, but obviously the buprenorphine group did have relatively higher levels of withdrawal, it just didn't reach the threshold of significance. If you look at it within a phase, and I think that this is very interesting, the clonidine and the tramadol groups both evidenced significantly higher withdrawal during the taper period than the post-taper period, but the buprenorphine group had um, almost equivalent levels of withdrawal during both of those periods. And the reason that this is potentially important is if you think about what a medical treatment looks like and a detox looks like, you only generally, we only generally see patients during the taper period. Once they get their final dose of a four or five day taper, then we don't see them again, that we don't follow up with them. And what this means is that the buprenorphine patients may actually be experiencing equivalent levels of withdrawal once we release them from treatment, um, uh, equivalent to what they had experienced while they were in treatment. But at that point, because they've been released, we're not able to give them any additional support or medications or counseling or you know, anything that might contribute to them um, not relapsing. Whereas the patients who received clonidine and tramadol experienced the majority of their withdrawal while they were under our care. Uh, you know, in, in a medical treatment during the taper period. So we can continue to support them and provide them additional symptomatic medications to help manage the withdrawal. And so that, I think this is, 
it's rare to see studies that follow uh, withdrawal after the, the final day of dosing. But I think that there's value in doing that just to demonstrate, just to see whether, you know, what's the persistent effect. Because we know patients uh, that leave detox are highly prone to relapse. And it could be, this is speculative, but uh, the fact that they're continuing to experience withdrawal during that period could contribute to that. We would need more data to know if that's the case or not, but I think it's worth examining. And then if you look at the number of people who completed treatment, <clears throat> we saw a drug-related effect that was consistent with what we thought. We're clonidine, uh, about 60% of people completed the treatment, about 70% of tramadol patients, and then about 80% or maybe 90% of the buprenorphine-maintained patients. So we saw this drug-graded effect where tramadol kind of fell between the two other drugs just like we thought. So the results of this trial suggest to us that tramadol did not differ significantly from, from buprenorphine um, in terms of withdrawal suppression during the taper, and that the participants who received clonidine and tramadol experienced the majority of their withdrawal during the taper period, uh, which we think has, you know, as I mentioned, positive effects. And uh, we conclude from this that tramadol has promise for uses in medication-assisted withdrawal or uh, detox or taper. Um, the value of tramadol is, uh, again, that this is a, a, me a medication that has been widely available. It's generically available. Physicians are familiar with it. So it's not introducing a new pharmacotherapy to their kind of profile of medications, but it's just suggesting that one of these medications that you've heard of before that you're familiar with may have value for treatment of opiate use disorder. And if you have concerns about the abuse potential of something like buprenorphine, then it's worth perhaps considering tramadol. It may not produce the same magnitude of effect, but it certainly seems to be better or more efficacious than clonidine. So we, so moving on to our secondary analyses, so we looked at, again, th these are our data regarding who completed the taper, and what I want to point out is that we still have uh, quite a bit of room for improvement, right? So these red bars here are the people that failed our treatment, and it's very important to us. We really wanted to identify if we can predict the people who don't do, who will not do well with certain forms of medication. So, you know, one of the ways that we can potentially address the lack of infrastructure or opiate uh, use disorder treatment availability is by better matching patients to treatments. If we know that clonidine works for some people but not others, uh, it would be important for us to be able to prospectively recognize somebody as being a person who would or would not respond to clonidine, for instance, so that we can reserve our more difficult to administer treatments like buprenorphine for the patients who um, we know won't respond to other medications. And so I want to bring you back to our naloxone challenge uh, which we did, again, just to stratify patients into our trial. But what this looks like, naloxone is Narcan, if you're not familiar with it. It's a very fast-acting opiate antagonist. Uh, if you administer it to somebody who has an opiate in their system, it will put them into um, withdrawal, in our case, for about a two-hour period. Uh, we did this with everyone that enrolled in the trial. And what happened is they came in in the morning. Uh, well, we, you know, they were residential. So we gave them their morning dose of morphine. We skipped their second dose. We collected a baseline assessment. We administered Narcan. Um, and it's the same dose that you would give to re reverse an overdose, so 0.4 milligrams um, IM injection. And then every 15 minutes, we rated, we had them rate their levels of withdrawal to us. Subjectively, we rated it. We also measured physiological things like uh, blood pressure and pupil size. And then at the end of the two hours, we gave them their second dose of morphine, so it eliminated any persistent withdrawal effects. Usually by that time, they were no longer experiencing withdrawal. We did this again to be able to derive a value to stratify patients into the study. Um, but in looking at these data, we realized we have a really rich data set because we have about 100 people who were all maintaining the same opiate and who had this a very rigorous naloxone challenge, and for who we collected very sensitive um, data in terms of 15-minute time points. And so we wanted to know, if you've worked with patients who are detoxing from opiates, your, your experience probably suggests that people have very different uh, responses to this. And some people will express high levels of withdrawal, and some people will express very low levels of withdrawal. And we wanted to know if we could actually quantify this. Can we see evidence of this in this uh, kind of controlled data set? And so we derived the area under the curve for the self-reported opiate um, questionnaire that we collected during the session. And we uh, subjected it to something called a cluster analysis, where we wanted to see if there were different kind of latent subgroups of people. Did, did people factor together in similar ways in terms of how they reported their withdrawal ratings? And we had no um, 
expectation regarding the number of clusters that we may see in this, but what we actually uh, found was that we had two primary groups of people, which I, I've identified here as cluster one and two, but we're also referring to as high withdrawal and low withdrawal. So cluster two are the high withdrawal phenotype, and cluster one is the low withdrawal. And this is, um, again, the self-reported withdrawal score is the basis on which we, we did this analysis. And so if you, we identified the cluster that people fell into, and then we looked at their withdrawal ratings during that visit, and we saw, in fact, that it did kind of match up. So that some of the people that, that had higher levels of withdrawal were uniformly higher um, in their reporting uh, relative to the people who had low levels of withdrawal. And then we used their definition of high or low withdrawal from this scale from this point forward. We never did that analysis again. We just used this as their definition of are they a high or low withdrawal responder. And we wanted to see how well their responses on this scale corresponded to the other measures that we had collected during this challenge. And so if you look at the COWS, which is the observer rated scale, we saw the same effect where if people said, if they self-reported being a high withdrawal responder, then the nursing staff who were collecting the data also reported higher levels of severity for those individuals than if they were a low withdrawal responder. And we saw it on other measures as well. So this is a visual analog scale of I feel like using. And we saw again, the high responders were, uh, or actually I'm sorry, this is a visual analog. This is a zero to four scale. Um, we saw that they reported higher levels of wanting to use than the low withdrawal group. We also saw increases in uh, systolic blood pressure, which is a known symptom of opioid withdrawal um, in the high withdrawal group. And we also saw uh, changes in pupil, although they didn't reach the level of significance. But so there were multiple factors, multiple domains on which if we char char characterize somebody based on um, their self-reported withdrawal into a higher low withdrawal phenotype, then we saw that same pattern play out across multiple different metrics. And if we looked at the individual scales, we, we wanted to see is it, is it really just one symptom that is driving the difference between these groups. But in fact, uh, the people that reported high withdrawal reported higher withdrawal on every symptom. Um, so all of the symptoms for the self-report and all the symptoms for the observer report. So it was the overall experience a higher magnitude of withdrawal. So then, this was exciting to us because we, we've thought for a while that people really do kind of differentiate into these different withdrawal groups, but we didn't know, we didn't have evidence of that. And so, um, but because we had these data prior to their enrollment in the clinical trial, we wanted to see if there was any evidence that the withdrawal rating group that we linked them into, the higher low withdrawal during the naloxone challenge also corresponded to their response in the clinical trial. And so if you look at cluster one, these self-reported ratings, again, cluster one is the group that we rated as having low withdrawal. You can see that these are the same data um, broken down by cluster. So these are the stabilization days, this is the taper phase, and this is a post-taper phase. So you can see from this, and these are very small, I'll, you know, I'll preface this saying these are preliminary, the, they're small cell sizes, and we weren't powered to prospectively look at this, so it's exploratory. But I think it's interesting and worth following. Uh, but you see that there's no differentiation between the medications in these groups, right? So a person that had this low withdrawal rating based on the naloxone challenge test, it didn't matter if they got clonidine or buprenorphine, they responded uh, equally. They, they rated their withdrawal as being the same um, throughout this period. However, if you look at the high withdrawal group, that's where you see the difference. So we see that during the taper period, the, the participants who had clonidine rated um, their withdrawal significantly higher during the taper relative to the buprenorphine and tramadol. I'll also point out to you here that in this group, we didn't see that increase in withdrawal that I showed you with the buprenorphine participants, but you saw it all in the high withdrawal group, right? So here you see that the buprenorphine group, that's the bump that you see um, that we saw in those other indicators. So they were the participants that were experiencing that delayed withdrawal. You also see evidence of it, a little bit of evidence of it with tramadol in this group, which is the orange here it's kind of hidden by the buprenorphine. And we didn't see any evidence of that in the primary trial, probably because the means eliminated that. So it looks like, based on their response in the naloxone challenge, it was associated in some clinical fashion with whether or not the medication sufficiently controlled their withdrawal in the randomized controlled trial. And again, we looked at this in multiple other indicators as well. So you see a similar effect if you look at, um, I like the way I feel, in this case it is a visual analog scale, zero to 100. 
<clears throat> and you see that uh, there were slight improvements. Uh, well, actually, um, no significant differences. And in this case, the buprenorphine actually was trended towards a little bit lower, um, which would be an odd finding. But uh, in terms of the taper and the post taper in patients who reported not having or having low withdrawal during the naloxone challenge test, which was a different session, versus the people who reported having high withdrawal during that challenge session, um, if they had buprenorphine, they, then they really liked how they felt, but if they had tramadol or clonidine, then they didn't. So again, the medication mattered in the persons who indicated that they had high withdrawal, but not in the people who had low withdrawal. And then we saw something similar with pupil diameter as well. So it wasn't just a relatively similar um, uh, relationships between the groups in the low withdrawal group, but when they were in the high withdrawal group, the, they had lower pupil, um, smaller uh, pupil sizes, which is indicative of lower withdrawal. So it wasn't just a self-reported effect. It was a it seems to be a, kind of a, a persistent physiological, like a different experience in patients that had, that during the naloxone challenge session, had higher low levels of withdrawal. So this, um, and then again, if you look at the relationship with taper completion, so persons, uh, the, in the participants who uh, had low withdrawal had relatively high rates of completion, 80%. If you've worked with opiate patients who are detoxing, you know 80% completion rate is high, and 100% in the buprenorphine group. And that's, I, I can't think of another study that's ever shown that. Um, and in the high withdrawal group, cluster two, that's where we see the dose dependent, or the drug dependent effect. So it does seem, perhaps that the response that they had in this challenge session actually related to their clinical response in a trial. So the general conclusion from this is that people may experience withdrawal in different ways. We need more data. I think that there's promise in, in exploring this laboratory session a little bit further as a potential medication screening session um, to, be, be, to kind of expand that further. We see that with alcohol and with nicotine trials. We have these really nice models where we can run pharmacotherapies through uh, a laboratory session, and, and we know how it relates to the performance in, an, uh, in a subsequent trial, but we don't have anything like that for opiates currently, and I think that there'd be a lot of value in that, because if we're trying to expand or advance treatment quickly, it would be nice to be able to, to quick screen a medication, know that it will or will not suppress withdrawal, and then try to advance it into a, a randomized trial. Um, so the question becomes, to what degree are non- well, the, the next question that we have is to what degree are non-opiate mechanisms contributing to the opiate withdrawal syndrome? And so I'll just kind of describe the next course of studies that we're um, planning to do. So this kind of comes from the, um, the symptom that one of the prominent opiate withdrawal symptoms is yawning. Yawning is not something that is known to be mediated by the opiate system directly, but it is something that is very heavily mediated by the dopamine system, particularly the D3 receptor of the dopamine system. And it's such a strong index of that that aside from doing a cellular study, if I give an animal a dose of a medication that I think has the D3 receptor, I can count the number of yawns that that animal has and use that as my index. It's a widely accepted index of how strong the drug is binding to that receptor. So we know that D3 is associated with yawning. We also know that yawning and opioid withdrawal has a somewhat different time course. So if you look at, these are data from Aloxone Challenge, and this is um, mean minutes. The uh, dark rating is the time to first endorsement of a symptom. And then the uh, gray bar is the time to peak uh, the most severe endorsement of the symptom. And you can see yawning falls at the end where it's one of the final symptoms to even be, uh, to even be elicited. And it takes the longest amount of time before it peaks. This suggests, it could suggest, that it is the recruitment of a different transmitter system. It's a downstream effect of the withdrawal syndrome that, that people are experiencing. And so we wanted to follow this up. And in looking at the preclinical literature, where there's plenty of evidence that um, the dopamine is pivotally involved in the expression of withdrawal in animals. So animals, rats that are made physically dependent on opiates, have changes in their neuronal firing patterns of, in the dopamine neurons um, in the terms of burst rates and prolonged refractory periods. And what this means is that if you, if you uh, look at the animal, if you make them physically dependent on an opiate and then abruptly discontinue it, they will show signs, somatic or physical signs of withdrawal for three days on average, and then they look like they've recovered. But in fact, if you, if you continue to measure their neuronal patterns, the changes in the dopamine neurons have persisted up to 11 days 
past that point, and that's just the, the last day on which the researchers studied this. So they didn't assume, they didn't think that they would have to continue past, you know, 14 days past the actual um, removal of the opiates. So we see these persistent neuronal changes in dopamine firing. We also know that the involvement of the dopamine system only occurs once the animals are made physically dependent on the opiates. So it doesn't, it's not at all involved in the acute administration of opiates. So it has to be, it's a, it's a conversion of the physical dependence. If we pre an animal with a dopamine agonist like L-dopa, amphetamine, cocaine, epimorphine, um, and then we elicit naloxone, or I'm sorry, we elicit withdrawal either by precipitating it with naloxone or just abruptly removing the opiates from the system, uh, can tapering them abruptly, we see that we increase the severity of some of the opiate withdrawal symptoms, but not all of them. And if we block, if we pre-treat them with a dopamine antagonist, and again, either elicit withdrawal through naloxone or by removing the opiate altogether, we block some of the withdrawal symptoms, but not all of them. So this is consistent with the idea that dopamine contributes in some capacity to the withdrawal symptom, to the withdrawal syndrome, but is probably not the primary driver. But it does give us um, a target. If we know that by tapering patients, you know, we've done multiple studies where we've tapered patients off of using different lengths of schedules and different dosing regimens. And um, we still see expression of withdrawal that's severe enough that patients leave treatment. We also know that even though, you know, we can demonstrate that a four-week taper is the most efficacious taper, hospitals and insurance um, structures are designed to only support a four-day taper. So they're not adopting these treatments. And so we know that there's still room for us to learn how to manage the symptoms better. And, and perhaps this gives us a target. So maybe if we also address dopamine-related symptoms in addition to opiate-mediated symptoms, people will do the, which all will be better managed and will have better outcomes. And so we're particularly interested in buspirone, which is sold as buspar. Buspar is a medication that's generically available. It's FDA approved for several years. It's sold as an anti-anxiety medication. If you're a physician or if you've worked with buspar, you probably don't have a positive opinion of it, and most people don't because it generally doesn't produce much of an effect. So most people will ask us, why, why in the world would you give buspirone? We know that it doesn't, it has very low effect on anxiety, it just doesn't really work. Um, but we're not interested in it because of its anxiety effects, we're interested in it because it's a potent D3 antagonist. And so we know, if we think that yawning is an index of dopamine D3 activity, and we have this preclinical literature suggesting that that's of value, we already have a drug that's generically available that we can try to see whether or not it would have some impact in uh, reducing the opiate withdrawal syndrome. There's been one controlled study that has looked at the effect of buspirone as a, a treatment for opiate use disorder. This was a study that tapered patients uh, who were, they were all men, and they were illicit opiate users. They were randomly assigned to one of four conditions. So they either had placebo, methadone only, methadone plus buspirone at 30 milligrams, and methadone plus buspirone at 45 milligrams. And this was the taper periods, days 6 through 14, double blind, double dummy, very rigorous study, small sample size. And this is the, uh, the withdrawal ratings with higher values being more uh, indicative of more severe withdrawal. And what they reported was that uh, when participants had placebo, they had relatively high levels of withdrawal. When they had methadone only, the withdrawal was better managed. If you combine methadone with buprenorphine, you saw a slight decrease in withdrawal, but if you combine uh, I'm sorry, methadone and, and buspirone at 30 milligrams, you had a slight decrease. And then if you had methadone and buspirone at 45 milligrams, that's when you saw the, the major decrease. So there's some evidence already that exists in the field that buspirone might be efficacious to minimize symptoms of opiate withdrawal. And then if you look at the specific symptom list, I've summarized it for you here, it looks as though 45 milligrams of buspirone could have a benefit on some but not all of the symptoms, which again is what we would we would expect based on uh, our understanding of the, the potential contribution of dopamine. So we don't think that um, a non-opiate drug can completely replace an opiate drug, but we think that perhaps layering them together would more comprehensively address the opiate withdrawal syndrome. So we saw they, they reported benefits on anxiousness, yawning, nose running, goose flesh, cold flashes, muscle aches and pains, restlessness, muscle, muscle twitching, stomach cramps, and cravings. So multiple different symptoms all of which are prominent opiate withdrawal symptoms that contribute to people uh, leaving treatment. So we wanted to see, we needed evidence that perhaps there is a beneficial effect here. And so we conducted um, with my colleagues at Hopkins, 
um, a small preclinical study to look at the effects of buspirone on opiate withdrawal expression in animals. So we had in the study 19 Sprague Dolly rats. We had four groups. Um, three of the groups were all made physically dependent on opiates. Uh, we used morphine. And then um, the groups were randomly assigned to risk uh, I'm sorry. Oops. I just lost my screen. On day six, uh, so for days one through five, they uh, were made physically dependent on morphine. One group was a vehicle only group. On day six, we precipitated withdrawal using naloxone. And two of the groups, we pre-treated them with a dose of buspirone that was equivalent to 45 milligrams in humans or 30 milligrams um, in humans. And then one group had a saline only, so that was a placebo group. And then we also uh, just administered buspirone at the highest dose in the final group just to make sure that buspirone itself wasn't leading to precipitated withdrawal symptoms. And then all the animals received uh, a naloxone precipitated withdrawal. And these, um, what these data show are all of, this, all of the symptoms of withdrawal collapsed together. So unfortunately, the symptoms of withdrawal that are expressed in animals are not directly related to what you would see in humans. So there's no way for us to, to sh there's no way for me to tell you that one withdrawal symptom in animals corresponds to an equivalent uh, symptom in humans. But what you can see here, these are the average number of um, withdrawal ratings that were identified, and these data were collected by two blinded individuals. So they rated the animals for withdrawal, and then we compared across them. And these are, the, again, this is morphine. This is the dose of buspirone that was equivalent to 45 milligrams in humans, and this is a dose that was equivalent to 30 milligrams. This is the placebo dose, and then this is the buspirone by itself. So we did see that the if you combine all of the symptoms together, we saw some signal suggesting that a high dose of buspirone um, might suppress some of the symptoms of opiate withdrawal and this naloxone precipitated challenge. And then if you break it down by individual symptoms, so I've grouped them here as symptoms that showed a strong signal, uh, perhaps a moderate signal, and then no signal. So things like teeth chattering, mastication in rears, which are all common uh, rodent withdrawal symptoms. You saw the buspirone almost completely eliminated these symptoms relative to placebo. So we saw significant, um, pretty strong signals for those specific symptoms. Uh, there's additional symptoms, grooming and chin rubs. These did not reach the level of statistical significance, uh, but we still saw what looked like a trend, a positive trend towards buspirone, reducing um, the severity of those symptoms. And then in other symptoms, we saw no effect at all. So we saw with shakes, we didn't see a positive effect. We didn't see anything with burrows or fecal boli. So it looks like it kind of supports our hypothesis that perhaps uh, the, the D3, well, I should say buspirone, presumably by its actions on the dopamine receptor system, are, is selectively attenuating some of the symptoms of naloxone precipitated withdrawal, um, but not all of them. And so the conclusions from this are that buspirone may have promise as an, as an empirically supported concomitant medication for opiate use withdrawal management our next step is we've received pilot funding to, to try to do this in humans. So we, there's a pain management clinic at Hopkins where patients uh, enroll and to try to taper down off of their clinically indicated opiate medications. So they're not necessarily illicit users, but they're just chronic pain patients who want to reduce their opiates. And so we are about to start a double-blind pilot trial where patients will either be assigned to placebo or to the 45 milligram dose of buspirone which will be dose 15 milligrams three times a day. And we'll be able to check and see if we do see a signal for reductions in withdrawal. And we'll look at things like withdrawal severity, but then also likelihood of um, staying in treatment and the number of additional medications that they request. So if they are randomized to the buspirone group, do they ask for additional symptomatic medications like ibuprofen and so on? Or um, is their withdrawal better controlled than the placebo group? We're hopeful, we're really hopeful that we can uh, that these data will be promising because we think that there's a lot of value in following up this line of research, but then also just more broadly um, empirically evaluating concomitant medications because it's something that we often do in opiate use disorder. We, uh, when we taper patients, um, clinics have different kind of constellations of medications they like to provide, and they're generally symptomatic, so it's ibuprofen or terazidone or promethazine or loperamide and things that treat specific symptoms, but they're not given uniformly. There's no recommendations for what to give or how often to give them or the doses. And, um, and it, as in part because of that, if you look across studies and try to see if there's any beneficial effect of these medications on opiate withdrawal management, 
we don't see one, and I think that part of the reason is because they're not, they're, they're kind of haphazardly, they're given by clinical indication, but they're not uh, uniformly or empirically supported. And I think that there's uh, the preclinical literature and some of this emerging literature, and some of this emerging data suggests that there's value in trying to empirically identify concomitant medications that could be more effectively layered. And in doing so, we might have a better chance of improving detox outcomes. So the general conclusions is that the opiate epidemic is leading to an unprecedented number of drug-related deaths. We have numerous options that work very well uh, if we can make them available to people. But the infrastructure remains a problem, and so treatment availability remains a problem. And some, some of our efforts at BPRU to combat the opiate use disorder uh, epidemic, we're trying to target the spectrum from prevention to treatment. So we want to identify medications that might be easier to prescribe or more widely available. We want to identify meaningful subgroups of patients so that we can better match them to treatments or predict outcomes, and then empirically identify or evaluate uh, some of the additional medications that we can give concomitant to opiates during a taper to try to increase efficacy. And so I'll just acknowledge all the, the numerous people that are involved with these studies. They're difficult to run. Um, and NIDA's support, and uh, thank you for giving me time to talk about this.